Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Amanda Cody, Assistant Professor of Media Studies and Game Studies in the School of Journalism and Communication at the University of Oregon. Cody's work focuses on the industry and culture of video games, with a particular emphasis on gender, representation, and issues of technological access. Her first book, Gaming Sexism, Gender and Identity in the Era of Casual Video Games, is forthcoming from NYU Press. Thanks, Amanda, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. So tell us a bit about your background and how you became interested in game studies. Were you a gamer? I was. Um, I grew up in the 90s, which was kind of a pivotal era for, in particular, educational PC games. Mm -hmm. Uh, And my parents, being smart people who saw the writing on the wall with regards to technology and computers, bought us all of those educational (laughs) PC games. Um, On top of that, my older brother actually won a Sega Genesis in a Hmm. Boy Scout popcorn selling contest. (laughs) And then our neighbors had a Nintendo, so we switched houses depending on which system we wanted to play at the time. But my interest in the academic study of games really arose in my undergrad years. I attended the University of Virginia, and at the time, the media studies program was competitive. You had to apply to major in media studies. Mm. And we had to write this essay about a media issue that was interesting to us. And I talked to all of my friends who were applying, and they were writing about film, 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 television. I said, okay, how can I stand out in this group of 120 people fighting for these 20 spots? Let me write about the world of Warcraft. And so I (laughs) wrote about the world of Warcraft. I got into the program. And then I kind of never stopped writing about video games because the more I looked into the area of game studies, the more I found questions that I thought were really interesting that people weren't necessarily addressing. So this field of game studies is emerging. So tell us a little bit about how you understand the field. What's, What's the field... Why, why is it an important field? Why is it happening now? That's a really interesting question, because the field is actually, I would say, becoming something slightly different right now. Hmm. Game studies as an academic field emerged in the early 2000s, largely coming out of computer studies. Mm-hmm. So it focused originally on video games. What were the technological aspects of them? What kinds of platforms were used? How were these important to the ways people interacted with each other, with society? Um, how was this important in terms of media effects? Uh, Video games and violence and aggression was, of course, a very big topic in Mm -hmm. early game Mm -hmm. studies. But we've started to realize recently that game studies as computer games only really only tells part of the story. We're in the middle of a board game revolution, so we're seeing uh, increased attention to analog games. Mm -hmm. Um, We've seen a huge rise in role-playing games like Mm -hmm. Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. And so game studies started as computer game studies, but is now expanding to talk about games and play much more generally. And that includes everything from journalistic news games, which my colleague uh, Dr. Maxwell Foxman studies, to playing Settlers of Catan at a bar with your friends. What are all of the different cultural, social, psychological, and physical impacts of these? So say a little bit more about why this is something that needs to be being studied in the academy. You've begun to talk about that. Say a little bit more. Why is this an urgent thing now? Um, For many reasons. One, play is becoming an increasingly prominent aspect of our day-to-day life. Mm -hmm. Uh, For instance, uh, there's a fitness app, Fitocracy, where as you complete different fitness goals, you earn points for them and level up a very traditional video game mechanism. And the argument is that giving these small rewards of points and levels help change our behavior, help us continue the things we want to do. So play is working into more and more areas of our life. And then, of course, even traditional video games are becoming more and more prominent. So understanding what impacts those have on broader society, broader culture, even politics, Mm -hmm. is something that we really need to pay attention to. For instance, if people play a lot of war games, could that affect their actual support for going to war as a political option? We don't know. That's a question we haven't fully addressed yet. So along the lines of beginning to address these intersections with gaming and other social issues. Let's talk a little bit about the forthcoming book, um, Gaming Sexism. So give us a, can you give us a kind of a thumbnail sketch of the argument of the book? Yes. So my research right now focuses primarily on gender in video games. And the reason for that is that video games have a very long history as a masculinized technology. They've been presented as something more for men and boys than for women and girls. Um, And this relates to advertising, the construction of games, how they're placed in Toys R Us, a whole bunch of factors. Mm -hmm. 
but the mid 2000s saw a challenge to that. One of the big starters of that challenge was the introduction of the Nintendo Wii, mm -hmm. which deliberately targeted families, moms, um, the elderly, all of these people who weren't part of games traditional audiences. And of course that was picked up by things like the rise of smartphones and mm -hmm. casual games. So these games that we carry around in our pockets that we have access to all the time that aim for this very broad, non-traditional audience. So my research started from that point because we saw a really interesting divergence. There was this argument that games were now for everyone, but at the exact same time there were really prominent instances of sexism, misogyny, racism directed at these new audiences. So my question was how are these two seemingly contradictory things happening at once? And the argument that the book puts forth is that they're actually a result of each other. Mm -hmm. The diversification of gaming towards broader audiences is perceived as, as, as threatening by traditional game audiences who are used to this being a preserve for them. What we call a homosocial space where people who share similar identities can bond, hang out, not have to worry about offending others. So the entrance of new types of players changes that. And so that becomes a threatening um, aspect where people fear that this space that was theirs, their safe space for so long is going away. So the book analyzes uh, the industrial structures, the ways changes in the industry are talked about to set that argument up. So a uh, crucial part of this story is the, the so-called Gamergate uh, scandal. So tell us what that was and how it fits into the picture. Yes, so Gamergate is one of the instances of sexism that I'm talking about that happens simultaneously alongside this narrative, games are for everyone. Gamergate was this instance provoked by um, a video game developer who released a very non-traditional storyline-based game called Depression Quest, and it came out and got a lot of critical acclaim. At the same time, her ex-boyfriend accused her of sleeping with games journalists to get positive coverage of that game. And a big contingent of the traditional game audience or at least a vocal minority of the video game audience picked up on that story and argued that this was showing that politics were entering into games, that games journalists were in the pocket of developers. They arguably were trying to promote better ethics or more open ethics in video game journalism. That was ostensibly the goal. But what Gamergate actually turned into was a very virulent harassment campaign against uh, this developer, Zoe Quinn, against female game developers in general, against people who allied with them. For instance, uh, game developer Phil Fish, who created the very critically acclaimed independent game Fez, um, stood up for Quinn and was so attacked for this stance that he ended up quitting the video game industry. Hmm. Um, and so it turned into this very strong online harassment campaign that actually drove multiple people out of their home for their safety. So comparing that to the narrative that games are open, everyone can be a gamer, games are diversifying, really highlights the conflict that was going on here. What, has there been any additional fallout from Gamergate? Has, have any of the harassers been identified or seen any consequences? There really haven't, um, and that's been part of the issue of online harassment campaigns. It's very easy to hide behind a screen name. It's very easy to cancel an account and start another one if you get blocked. Um, and actually, one of the arguments that I put forth in the book is that Gamergate, while it got a lot of national attention, while it got a lot of press coverage, is really only a symptom of the larger problem. Gamergate is an emblematic instance of gaming sexism that is ongoing. And so one of the things I argue in the book is that focusing on something like Gamergate and mm. saying this is the event neglects the fact that sexism in gaming was happening well before uh, that date, which was 2014, and continues to happen well after there. So one of the chapters in the book interviews female gamers about their experiences with Gamergate and how that resonated to them, and it finds that it really didn't. They were so well practiced at already dealing with sexism in game spaces that this event, yes, got a lot of prominent attention, yes, got a lot of press coverage, mm -hmm. but for them was was an expected part of entering into game spaces. So tell, tell me a little bit more about what you learned from these female gamers that you spoke with. I know part of what you did was a kind of uh, ethnographic work of uh, field work with these these uh, 37 yes. uh, women. Um, s tell us some of the things that y you learned from them about what that culture is like for them. Yes, so like I said, uh, the start of the book is setting up this divergence, games diversification versus ongoing sexism. Where does that come from? The second half of the book is then based on interviews with, as you said, 37 uh, self-identified female gamers about 
what their experiences are like as this conflict is happening. Are games opening up? Are they still facing significant barriers? What do those look like? And again, they kind of argued that both were happening simultaneously. They were very optimistic. They saw a lot of positive changes in, for instance, how female characters were represented. Mm -hmm. They saw more games offering them the option to play as a female character than they had previously. Um, but at the same time, they were being subjected to a lot of harassment in online game communities, a lot of forms of exclusion. And so some of the things that I talk through in the book are the very overt obvious forms of sexism they face, things like hypersexualized character design, things like actual harassment. But then it also goes on to talk about some of the more, um, what I call inferential sexist forces, things that on the surface don't seem sexist but have unequal gender assumptions at their basis. So one is many women found it off-putting that they were often treated with surprise. When they came on voice chat and online gaming, the reaction they got wasn't help or assistance or something game focused. It was, oh my gosh, you're a girl. Well, these reactions over time made them feel abnormal, anomalous, out of place, mm -hmm. diverged them from a gaming community. If we look at a surprise reaction, it doesn't seem as sexist as out and out harassment, but it has some of the same impact. So we talk through how they deal with both overt and implicitly sexist forces and what impacts these have on their play experiences um, and even on their goals uh, to be feminist or not. How they took action to try and normalize the stance of women as gamers or times where perhaps they hid their identity because mm -hmm. they didn't have the energy to deal with that. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about that. Is there hiding of gender among these women gamers sometimes? Yes, very much so. So I found that a lot of people, a lot of my interviewees, um, were willing to take activist stances. For instance, a lot of them would have a, a game username that was obviously female. Mm -hmm. And when they wanted to prove their skill, prove that women could be competitive gamers, they would play on that account and take this very deliberate activist approach. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the times when they'd been working all day and were tired and just wanted to play for fun, they'd maybe have another account with a more gender neutral name. Mm -hmm. Or they wouldn't use voice chat because they knew that the moment somebody heard a female voice, they were opening themselves up to the possibility of harassment. So it's this very big struggle between wanting to change the perception of women as serious gamers, seeing that as necessary to changing the overall culture of game communities, mm -hmm but then also this, this self-preservation and this need to sometimes hide who you were, even if that contributed to the idea that men gamed more than women. Hmm. Interesting. So you mentioned one of the areas uh, is this hypersexualized representation of female characters within the games. Tell me how that's changing. Um, I mean, I assume that more and more women not only are playing games, but are designing and creating games. You want to say something about how that's changed the industry? Yes. So right now, the video game industry is still extremely male-dominated. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain areas where women have higher representation, but those tend to be in places like public relations and marketing, mm. and less in places that actually create the games. There's a lot of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. um, computer science programs, how we socialize women towards or away from computers as their children. Mm -hmm. um, but there it, are some increasing interventions. So there are groups um, such as Dames Make Games, mm -hmm. or Women in Games International, or the Pixels. These are all industry-based incubators for women designers. Mm -hmm. And so there is some change there. Um, there's also a growing recognition that targeting only male gamers is artificially limiting who mm -hmm. you can sell your games to. Sure. There's a really interesting study by uh, Nikki Yee, who's a researcher down in California, where he compares games to other games within their own genre. Mm -hmm. And he finds that games that signal inclusivity, for instance, by offering you a male or female character option, mm -hmm. by including LGBT characters, actually tend to outperform other games of the same genre. Mm -hmm. So the industry is starting to realize that including broader audiences is a positive thing for their sales, mm -hmm. not just for culture and, and uh, representation. So there are some changes happening. And like I said, my participants were very positive about those. For instance, they referenced the Mass Effect series as one that offered male characters and female characters equally deep storylines. Um, recently, one of my favorite video game series, the Assassin's Creed series, came out with a game where you could choose to play a male character or a female character, and reviews said that the female character was actually the more interesting and dynamic one. They mm. really praised her voice acting and her dynamism. So we're seeing some changes, um, and people are pretty positive about those. 
they are also provoking some backlashes. There are some characters, uh, or some players, who argue, why are you messing with my game? This is the game I've always loved. How dare you change it? So we're still seeing this change in resistance. But right now I'm feeling decently optimistic that those changes will last, if only because the industry recognizes that it's good for their profit line. So your project is primarily about gender and sex sexism, but you are also interested in intersectionality and other kinds of subject positions b besides female. So let's talk a little bit about the representation of people of color, both in the games, how people of color are represented in the games, and the, the status of people of color as gamers. Mm -hmm. Yes, so while my book focuses primarily on gender, um, and I did primarily speak to white women because of course having an intersectional identity makes it harder for you to speak up in game spaces. Um, there are some conclusions that we can think through. One, people of color tend to be underrepresented in games the same way female characters are. Multiple content analyses have shown this. On top of that, um, when they are represented, they often are stereotyped or tokenized. You get the one black character in a cast of otherwise white characters. And there's a lot of resistance to that, um, not only among audiences of color, but also, for instance, my participants said it would be great if we had the opportunity to play as fully realized dynamic colors or dynamic characters who weren't men and white men at that. Mm -hmm. So there's a greater push for diversity for the sake of, of seeing different types of stories. That hasn't been capitalized on as much as we would like right now. Um, right now, players of color still tend to show up the most in sports games, mm -hmm. um, or I believe fighting games mm -hmm. is the other mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. and less as you know main characters in storyline-based games where you're playing as a player of color. Mm -hmm. Now, the independent video game industry is actually pushing back against that a little bit. There's a fantastic indie game called Never Alone that came out recently that tells the story of... Um, the Inupiaq tribe mm -hmm. and was was created in consultation with that tribe. Mm -hmm. So it tells some of their um, stories and myths throughout the gameplay. And so we are seeing some pushes to introduce greater diversity um, in games, but a lot of that is currently happening at the independent stage rather than among the biggest industry producers. I'm, I'm sure this is an unfair question, but I'm, it just occurs to me. So there are some games like World of Warcraft where there are all these races there's orcs, and I mean, do we find that um, women and pl gamers that are female and of color prefer to play those games where the white male subject is really not a major, necessarily a kind of default position? Mm. World of Warcraft is an interesting, interesting <laughs> can of worms because <laughs> it does offer a, a good amount of diversity. World of Warcraft allows you to choose your character. You've always been able to choose a male or female character. Mm -hmm. A lot of the races tend to be based on strange stereotypes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For instance, there's, mm -hmm. oh, I haven't played World of Warcraft in a while, but I believe there's a goblin race mm -hmm. that is uh, somewhat Jamaican mm -hmm. in origin. Mm -hmm. And so there's some really interesting work done by, I believe David Leonard is mm -hmm. up in Washington, who talks about the kind of ways in which real life race gets mapped onto video game species or races huh, and how that kind of perpetuates a lot of stereotypes. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like how Zoe Saldana keeps playing green-skinned aliens, right. um, the way we hide people of color behind veneers of other types of species. And that happens quite a bit in World of Warcraft. Hmm, interesting both in positive and negative ways. Um, obviously, the perpetuation of these stereotypes is negative, but a lot of players of color uh, anecdotally have chosen to play as like the night elf race mm -hmm. in the world of Warcraft mm -hmm. because that offers them a darker skinned option that doesn't automatically identify them as black and set them up for the types of harassment we see of players of color. Mm. So there are some forms of subversion and resistance that go on mm. um, alongside this kind of tokenization, but it's really interesting to see the play out between those two. Hmm. Fascinating, fascinating. So let's talk a little bit about gaming internationally. So this is not simply an American phenomenon. Um, it's happening all over the world, yes? Yes. Um, are there... I mean, I, I'm sure the cultures of gaming are different in different places. Are the games different? Yes and no. So the video game industry is 
global, exceedingly global. Um, Japan and the U.S., for instance, have both been dominant forces since the 1980s. Um, Ubisoft is one of the largest video game publishers. They're located in France. Hardware production tends to take place in, for instance, Southeast Asia and India, where we would expect. So a lot of games gain international audiences. That said, there are different styles of games. So for instance, Japanese games tend to have a very particular art style. They tend to represent their characters perhaps more androgynously, mm -hmm. whereas in the US we might see a higher preponderance of super muscular, uh, broad-shouldered men. That tends to be less common in Japanese games. And certain types of genres are more popular in some places than others. For instance, Japanese-style role-playing games, JRPGs, tend to be very popular in East Asia. Um, a little bit less so in the United States because mm -hmm. they're very time intensive, they're very involved, they take, you know, 100 hours to play through. Only certain types of North American gamers are willing to commit to that. But they're available in mm -hmm. the United mm -hmm. States and, and many people do commit to playing those. So we do see some differences in representation, we see some differences in the types of games that are popular, but there is a lot of crossover. So the University of Oregon now has a varsity esports team. So first yep. of all, what is esports? And tell us a little bit about that. So eSports is competitive video gaming. Um, it's highly organized. Um, there are eSports tournaments across a wide variety of different games. And so it's becoming in many ways a new platform for colleges and universities to have athletes play on. Uh, so here at UO, I believe we have an Overwatch team, a Rocket League team, and I know there are more that I'm blanking on and right now. And they're building an eSports uh, well, I don't know what you call it, a lounge or a, like a room uh, in yes. EMU. Yes, so <laughs> eSports is a huge, uh, it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar industry at this point, which hmm. is for many people surprising because when you think of traditional stereotypes of gamers, you think very non-athletic, nerdy, yeah, like yeah. they, the, it's nerds versus jocks is one of our very yeah, standard right. media tropes. Um, but eSports is a very involved, very competitive um atmosphere and so for instance if you're playing League of Legends you are separated into teams the members of your team take on different roles one of you for instance heals one of you plays a role where you kind of run out in front of everybody else and take all the damage while everyone um, attacks from behind you so you have these different specialized roles that person's called a tank then there's damage per second people and then healers these are standard roles across a lot of video games but it takes a lot of coordination People tend to learn the skills of one role over others, so they tend to take that on as their specialty. Mm. They tend to become really good at one game, often at the expense of others, similar to how we would see somebody become really good at football rather than basketball. And so a lot of those kinds of traditional competitive structures are, are present and there. I'm really interested to see how it goes mm. at the collegiate level. Yeah, that's I was wondering new. about that because you said it's, it's this multi-million dollar industry, uh, as is college football. But the NCAA is involved in a variety of complicated and problematic ways. But the, the athletes do not benefit from the monies uh, officially that are... Is there something like that? Is there some kind of NCAA of esports? So thus far, as far as I know, it could have changed at any moment. Um, as far as I know, the NCAA has thus far not accepted esports as an athletic event. And therefore, as it's happening on collegiate campuses, it is not being overseen by the NCAA. Hmm. Given that it's becoming a really large thing, I would expect that that would change. Mm -hmm. um, my own knowledge of esports is right now a little bit lacking. Mm -hmm. Most of my existing research has been on individual players. I'm just now starting to get involved in esports e research, in part because I'm here at the mm -hmm. University mm -hmm. of Oregon. So myself and a couple of my other colleagues in the School of Journalism, uh, Maxwell Foxman and Henry Ware, have put together an esports research cluster mm -hmm. with a number of our graduate students. And so we are in the very early stages of figuring out how do esports compare to traditional athletics? How do people here at camp on campus feel about esports? In comparison to more traditional athletics, is there this sense that you should support your esports team the same way you support your football team? Um, what does it mean from an industrial standpoint? Mm -hmm. How do the players see this as a path to becoming professional video game players or not? These are all questions that were in the very early stages okay, of Okay, so addressing. in a couple of years, we'll ask you back, years, and I want to learn about that. We can do a whole panel <laughs> with all three of us. <laughs>
and we'll present <laughs> our findings. Be, good, that'll be great. Um, we, we, we don't have that much time left. Let's talk about your teaching. So you've told us about the research that you do in game studies. How do you teach game studies? What happens? Well, I'm about to teach it this term. Uh, it starts tomorrow at 8 a.m. The last time I taught game studies uh, was a couple years ago at a different institution to a very small class of 20. Here at UO, I will have 70 students. 70 students commit to my 8 a.m. class. It fills the second day of registration. I was very surprised. <laughs> not at all surprised. 8 a.m. <laughs> is not everybody's favorite time. Um, but we're going to kind of try and do, in many ways, what games do. My teaching philosophy is based somewhat off of my research area. So when you're playing a video game and you get a new skill, that you learn the button press for that skill, and then you're kind of immediately given a scenario where you have to apply it. Press A to climb the side of a building. Okay, people start shooting at me, and my only way out is to climb the side of a building. So that's kind of the approach I try to take to my teaching as well. We learn a new theory, we learn a new concept through a brief lecture or through our readings, and then we have something applied. How would you actually do this if you had to in the real world? So an example would be something like, we have a class on game design, how you write the rules of a game and, and what it does when you write those rules. So we have our theoretical readings about it, but then one of the questions is, okay, think about something like Monopoly. Read the actual rules. Think about how your family actually played it. Nobody plays Monopoly according to the real rules. What does it change or do when you play your way versus via the actual rules? Most of us actually make Monopoly a much slower game than it should be. So we'll have that kind of applied practice after we learn the theories about why rules matter and what they do. Hmm. Well, Amanda, we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank you so much for talking to us today. The work that you do is really fascinating, and I definitely am going to bring you back to tell us more about esports once you've completed that research. All right, sounds good. Thanks so much for talking to us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. I've been speaking with Amanda Cody, Assistant Professor of Media Studies and Game Studies in the School of Journalism and Communication at the University of Oregon. Her first book, Gaming, Sexism, Gender, and Identity in the Era of Casual Video Games, will be published later this year. Thanks so much for watching.